The Sustainability Now Telesummit is honored to share audacious ideas and innovative solutions from more than 30 experts from around the globe. Learn how we can work together to shape a world that works. Here's your host, Mira Rubin. Welcome back to the Sustainability Now Telesummit, shaping a world that works. I am so delighted to introduce Summer Bach to you. Summer is an herbalist, a health coach, and master fermentationist. Now, we all know that our diet is essential, an essential factor in our health, but most of us aren't aware of how important the bacteria in our gut are to promoting and maintaining health. And fermented foods are a critical piece in, uh, in bringing health to that gut biome. And that's what Summer's here to share with us today. Welcome. We're so glad to have you, Summer. Thanks. I'm excited to be here. And I'm honestly just very appreciative that you're putting all of this together. I think this is a great resource for people. Thank you. I think so too. And it's the intention is to bridge all these different disciplines as a holistic view of sustainability so that we can all have one voice together. Nice. So you have a slide presentation for us, yes? Do you want to jump into that right away or you want to give us a little foundation? Well, I'll just quickly tell my story. You know, I, you know this was, uh, when was this? this was, I mean, the story, it progresses. But back in 2001, I can say that, I did a cleanse for the first time. And I was studying herbal medicine and they were teaching us about different modalities. And on day five... I felt like a wool blanket had been pulled out of my brain. And I looked around and I was like, oh my gosh, the world is crystal clear. Oh my gosh, I don't have any anxiety. You know, and I, I realized, oh, this is how normal people function. Like that was the first time I had ever felt that way. So previous to that, you know, I just thought I was normal. I thought this is how everybody felt. I did this cleanse and then I realized I'm not actually that well. Like I could feel this good and that became the carrot. I was like, I need to feel this good all the time. I had a lot of health concerns. And so over the next few years, I just became more and more aware of how many things were off in my body. I was bloated. Um, I had constipation. I would also get hives randomly on my legs, on my chest, sometimes all over my neck. Like I would just have these hives breakouts. I had a ton of anxiety. Um, it reached the point when I was in college to where I was having panic attacks three to five times per week. And sometimes in the middle of the night, I would wake up in the middle of the night in a full-blown panic attack with my heart rate way above 100. And I, you know, I was sleeping. <laughs> and so, you know, I didn't really understand what was going on. And I was eating foods and I was having reactions to all these different foods. And there was really only about 30 foods that I could eat comfortably that didn't cause some sort of problem in my body, either my throat to be itchy or my mouth to feel weird or my stomach to bloat up or to cause hives. And um, I, I started developing environmental allergies where, where, you know, obviously my eyes and my nose were running all the time and I was itchy, but like my, my whites of my eyes started to swell up bigger, like above the irises almost. It was gross. I've had that happen actually. Really? Yeah. I've yes. only heard this from a few people. It is so uncomfortable. It is very weird and it freaks you out. And so, you know, I was dealing with all these different things and I was going to various doctors and I was going to various naturopathic doctors as well. And everybody was like, you have candida, blah, 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 like tell me all these different things I needed to do. And at this point I was trained as an herbalist. I was taking herbs for all the different things, you know, herbs for my liver to help clear up the hives, herbs for my liver to help with the allergies, herbs for my digestion to aid in all the things that were not working well. I was taking, you know, herbs for my adrenal health because I was exhausted, herbs to try to calm down to help with the anxiety, you know, and so I was doing all these things and they would all work a little bit, you know, it wasn't, it just wasn't taking me all the way there. Um, and then I went to a training with a naturopathic doctor and she talked to me about probiotics and this is way back in the day. This is before they were big time. This was, you know, you, you couldn't even Google this stuff. And she taught me about probiotics. I started taking them and I actually noticed a considerable difference. And, uh, you know, being trained as an herbalist, I'm a purist. I wanted to know what's the whole food form of probiotics. Like how did my ancestors 500 years ago get this? Because I know they weren't taking these little pills that they make in a lab, right? And so uh, that was the big question. It's always amazing. Those questions that you ask, that's what leads you down some of the most amazing paths. And that's when I discovered fermented foods. 
you know, through a little bit of research, asking around and digging. And then conveniently, my mom sent me a book called Wild Fermentation by Sandor Katz. This all happened within a few months. And so I became obsessed and I started fermenting everything. I got Sally Fallon's book, Nourishing Traditions, and I was culturing literally every single thing that went into my mouth. I may have gone overboard. <laughs> um, it is very possible that I ate too much. Um, but, you know, that's... That's how I am as an American. We're taught to supersize it. We're taught to like, if a little bit is good, a lot must be great. That's right. So I went crazy with it. And I was making so many uh, fermented veggies that I started putting the excess in jars into my fridge in the garage. We had an extra fridge in the garage. And we kind of lived in the country a little bit um, where I was going to college. And people would actually come over to visit my roommates and they would, you know, I'd let them try it and, you know, they'd go and they'd buy some out of the fridge and had a little jar and people would put money in and people started, the word got out. People started hearing about it and pe random strangers would come in my garage, grab sauerkraut, leave some money. It was all the honor system and it was just fantastic. And so, you know, the really cool part that I noticed that I think is just a powerful observation was that there were, there were folks that would try it that didn't like it. And they would taste it and they'd be like, mm, not really for me. And that no big deal. Okay. Everybody has a different taste. But the crazy part was that a week later, these people would come back and buy sauerkraut out of the fridge and they would say over and over, I heard this 25 times. And then I was like, okay, I'm definitely onto something. <laughs> they said, you know, I took a bite. I didn't like it. And then for the rest of the week, this is all I could think about. And my body has been craving it ever since. And I was like, oh my gosh. I have discovered, not, you know, I mean, it was, it existed, but I have found, rediscovered an addictive, healthy food. Like this is gold. This is amazing. And I actually started my own sauerkraut company and, you know, went down this whole path, having a lot of fun with ferments and which I've, I've since sold that sauerkraut company. And I focus primarily on educating people online around digestive issues and fermentation. But, you know, it was, it's, it's really been a fun, wild ride because taking the ferments did something more for me than just the probiotics we're doing alone. And I, you know, like I said, I opened up this can of worms that I have been hanging out in ever since partying with all these little worms, <laughs> having a lot of fun, just like digging into the science behind fermentation. Why, why even like, do we have this acquired taste? Why were these people's taste buds changing in such a short amount of time? And what is that connection between the gut? Like, how does the body know to say, Hey, taste buds, I want you to like this thing now because it's doing something for us. And I've, you know, since I've just delved into all the different fermented foods that I can possibly get my hands on. And there are many different kinds all over the world. All these cultures have traditional ferments that they've been eating for some of them tens of thousands of years. And when you look at, you know, some of the, like, I, I'd say United States is the best example for me because I mean, this is where I live. This is where I grew up. The only ferment that we really have is yogurt as far as like a functional ferment that has probiotics in it. And that is a very industrial practice. And I'll, I'll delve into that more into in, in, in the class, but you know, it, it fascinated me to realize, like, I have a lot of German heritage and, you know, sauerkraut is deep in my bones. And so I really got fascinated with all these different cultures and how they've had these fermented foods that have, you know, stayed with them for thousands of years and why. And why do different cultures have different, <clears throat> different kinds of ferments? So That's a great question. These are all the things I've been playing with and having fun with. And it's just, it's, a, it's one of those subjects where you dive in and you're like, I didn't realize how much I didn't know about this. So I, I hope to, you know, give everybody a chance to learn some of what they didn't realize they didn't know about this very fascinating topic. And you're really taking the whole concept of food as medicine to a new level with these different ferments and recognizing that they have impact in different contexts, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So it's not, it's not like all fermented food is good for everybody all the time there are specific conditions that do well with different ferments, right? That's right. And um, at the very end of the class, I'll, I'll jump into, um, I picked one example. I, mean, I have over 30 different health conditions, chronic health conditions that I've studied and, and looked into the research and found which ferments and which bacteria would be the best for that situation. And so I picked insulin resistance because I feel that that is one of the most pervasive chronic health conditions that we deal with today because, you know, all the way from 
type two diabetes or even Alzheimer's, which they're calling type three diabetes. I haven't um, heard that. Yeah, that it's, it could actually be, pre, you know, it's part of an insulin regulation thing and like a damage from wow. high blood sugar. Uh, and, and then also like there are so many st stages of pre-diabetes and pre-pre-diabetes where people are getting their fasting glucose taken and they think they're fine. But those ranges, we, there's people who believe, there's protect, doctors that believe that these ranges may be off. They may be a little too high because we've been looking at a culture for a long time that has been pre-diabetic. So uh, we'll talk about insulin resistance just because I think that applies to literally everyone. I've had periods of my life where I've been more insulin resistant than others. And I, I think that, you know, it's, it's part of a normal, healthy kind of lifestyle, like depending on how much food you're eating. And I think back in the day, even when, when we ate more seasonally, I believe that people would get a little bit more insulin resistant in the summer when there was all this food to eat and then they would store some of that fat so they could make it through the winter and then they'd get it, go into keto in the winter and get rid of all of that and their insulin resistance would go way down. So I don't think it's abnormal. I just think that we're staying in it all the time. So I'm, my hope is to share that one and give people some ideas of what, you know, what ferments would really be beneficial and which ones are not. Great. So there's three different kinds of fermentation. And I think this is important because we think of fermented foods as just this like one group of thing, one group of foods, and maybe they're all healthy. I, I don't know. It's fermented. Let's eat it. So I want to dive in and start to dissect some of the components here. There's lactic acid fermentation, and this is when yeasts and bacteria convert starches and sugars into lactic acid. This is sauerkraut, kimchi, pickles, yogurt, and sourdough bread. There's ethyl alcohol fermentation, which is when starches or sugars are broken down by yeasts into alcohol and carbon dioxide molecules to produce wine and beer. And this can also be a second stage fermentation where um, you, you can actually get vinegar to be transferred into ethyl alcohol as well. Then, then acetic acid fermentation, also known as vinegar. This is when starches or sugars from grains or fruit are converted into sour tasting vinegar and condiments. And really like this is the difference between apple cider vinegar and apple cider. The apple cider becomes the apple cider vinegar after these certain bacteria come in and digest it. And there are four reasons that we ferment things. We didn't actually start fermenting just to like build a healthy microbiome. We didn't do it for the probiotics. We didn't even know what germs were until the 1800s. And so like it, it, it's really fascinating that 10,000 years ago, people were doing this for various reasons. Preservation of food, you know, making sauerkraut. Like that's, it's a way to preserve these vegetables over the winter so that you don't end up with vitamin C deficiency, scurvy. Um, and, and you're able to, to make these vegetables last longer when they're not growing in the ground. Kimchi is another great example of this. This is watermelon radish kimchi that I make at home. I love. Um, also, th this is just a whole picture that I took at my house of all the different ferments. Um, but dairy kefir, as well as vinegar, which is that dark purple ferment back there, that's a red wine vinegar. And the, the stuff floating in it is the SCOBY that stands for Symbiotic Community of Bacteria and Yeast. And those bacteria and yeast produ produce these like gelatinous mushroomy things that that help ferment that red wine into vinegar. And whenever at my house, whenever anybody leaves a little glass left over in the bottle, I just pour it in there and feed it. Uh, yogurt is a great example of, you know, pr preserving milk. You know, at one point in time, like milk was a really important staple to keep us alive. And so if we ferment it, it's going to last longer. It's going to stay more stable and it won't spoil. And then the same with cheese. You know, cheese is w when it's actually fermented in that way, it's, it's drying out all of these liquids, which makes it possible to create an environment that's very, very stable. And the interesting thing about the, the preservation of food is that the bacteria and, that, and the yeasts that are in there fermenting, they're creating these amazing acids that change the pH and kill off any foodborne pathogens. So that's why we're able to preserve with these processes of fermentation because it creates this acidic environment and this ecosystem. And I'll, I'll talk about some of the other things that are created by these bacteria that are so amazing that allow for these foods to stay stable and not spoil. The other reason that we ferment is the increased assimilation of food. And this is going to be things like tempeh, miso, injera. This is some chickpea miso that I made. Um, 
this is also dairy ferments, breads, and natto. Natto is a soybean ferment. And increased assimilation of these foods, what it means is that grains and beans tend to be a little bit harder to digest. They contain phytates and other enzyme blockers that are important for the seed. They keep the seed stable. They keep the seed from germinating where it's not supposed to grow. It waits till the conditions are exactly right. And so those enzyme, blo enzyme blockers are preventing germination, essentially. But those enzyme blockers also, they attach to a bunch of enzymes in our system, and we're not able to fully digest them. It blocks those enzymes from functioning. So it's very fascinating to me that we've learned how to process many beans and grains so that we can increase their bioavailability of nutrients. So like bread, we don't ferment bread to make it last longer because the grain actually by itself is going to last longer than the bread. We do it so that we can make that food substance more digestible. So we're pre-digesting the food using bacteria. So bacteria and yeasts, they're literally like eating it first and then we're eating the seconds. <laughs> The other reason that we do this is to also make food edible. And this is an interesting class of ferments. Um, this is like coffee, chocolate, cassava. And these are coffee beans right after they've been fermented and dried. And if you see that like kind of dark brown, so it looks kind of like it was probably sticky when it was wet. That substance is part of the berry. And they've like perfected this over the past decade or so. It's like become a very fascinating science within the coffee world. And they've perfected this to where they can influence the flavors of the actual coffee when you're drinking it. But that fermentation process is key because you want to get the berry off. And it's really the only way we figured out how to do it. It turns it into mush and allows it to disintegrate and acidify. But as it acidifies, it creates all these different flavor profiles on the outside of the bean. And it also helps to cure and preserve that bean. So very, very cool. We do that with chocolate um, and also cassava root, which is a, a, a very toxic root. You can't actually eat it unless it's been fermented. Um, and it's very necessary. So you have to reduce these potentially toxic um, cyanogenic glucosides is what they're called. And that's what's present in the fresh cassava. And that is so important because you need to actually be fermenting it for about four days. And there are people who have tried to bypass this and like, you know, make it speed it up. You know how we are today. Like, let's make it faster. And they tried to do it for two days. And there are cases of food poisoning that have been attributed to this practice. So this traditional practice of fermenting it for four to six days is what is required to actually detoxify the roots so that we can eat them. The next and final category is fermenting for psychoactive properties which I think is very fascinating, quite honestly. This is kombucha. Um, this also includes beer, wine, liquor, tea, Camellia sinensis. So like black tea, uh, Earl Grey, Puer, these are all teas that have been fermented. And actually, if you look at green tea, green tea is usually not fermented. Um, once it turns into like a black tea, all these different flavors of black tea that you see, they are all from the exact same plant. Wow. The difference is that they've been fermented in different ways. They have all these ancient practices for fermenting these tea, this, these tea leaves to make them taste different and change the acidity and make certain bacteria grow on it and do things, and it's just fascinating. There's other ones I listed on here. Some, I, like Bazi, I'm not as familiar with. Toddy, I've never tried it. It's from India. Um, Makioli, which is from Korea, and sake. And these are all, you know, there's, there's actually a huge, huge list of liquors and wines and beers that are created all over the world that we make just purely for the psychoactive qualities, for the relaxing quality of the ethyl alcohol that's created. So let's talk about what fu functional ferments really means then. These are fermented foods that provide a health benefit to the human eating them. So there's a category of foods called functional foods. And you know, I'm just creating a subcategory here. I came up with this term because I was like, you know what? There's got to be a difference between like drinking liquor and you know, drinking water kefir. Like there's got to be. So like let's delve into this and start to understand what are some of these differences. So let's talk about the components of functional ferments that that make them functional, that provide that added health benefit. First off is organic acids. This is lactic acid and or acetic acid. These are the sour flavors that really distinguish 
the flavor of fermented foods, that sour flavor in yogurt, that sour flavor in sauerkraut. People think that sauerkraut is just all vinegar, but it's not actually when you make it traditionally, you add zero vinegar. And in fact, vinegar will kill off the live probiotics and sauerkraut. So that these byproducts are, are created by bacteria as they ferment and organic acids act as fertilizer for the microbiome. So they're acidic. They actually affect the pH of the digestive tract. So your stomach is supposed to be really acidic. And as we age and as we are stressed out, all these reasons our stomach acid can start to decrease. And then it makes it easier for us to have gut infections lower down in our digestive tract. So when you start eating more fermented foods, you can actually increase the, you know, the pH or you can decrease the pH of the stomach and increase the power of the stomach acid to help break down and kill bacteria that shouldn't be making it through the digestive tract. And like what I talked about with the preserving, um, using fermentation to preserve foods, we're using these organic acids as a way to kill off foodborne pathogens. So it's really fascinating to me when you, when you consume these organic acids, not only are you going to shift the pH of the stomach, it's going to help shift the pH of the intestines and all the bacteria that live in acidic foods like sauerkraut and kimchi, they can survive this, the stomach acid and they can make it down into the lower intestines. And this all starts to shift and change the microbial makeup of the gut uh, and, and just help support that system. Next up is enzymes. So bacteria and yeast, they produce and they excrete enzymes to digest food and facilitate their own metabolic processes. So they're using enzymes to break down the starches in you know, the cabbage, or they're using enzymes to break down the uh, sugars in dairy foods. The lactic acid bacteria that's found in sauerkraut produces cellulase, and that breaks down fiber. And, you know, this is the same kinds of bacteria that live in the large intestine and they break down the food that your body was unable to digest. Humans don't produce cellulase. So when your undigested fiber reaches the large intestine, the bacteria can actually begin breaking it down and excreting amazing byproducts like short chain fatty acids, such as butyrate, acetate, and propionate. And these are a really important source of energy for us. And all of those short chain fatty acids actually feed other bacteria. It's the, it's the only food source for certain bacteria that are important to have in our digestive system. And so that's the cool thing. It's like there's this ecosystem happening in our body where all these organisms are creating substances and other organisms are feeding off those substances and they're all creating this like amazing balance and living together. But you know, the other cool thing that is created in the large intestine by these bacteria, uh, some of them produce vitamin B and vitamin K. And these two vitamins are very difficult to digest and absorb through food because they get broken down early on in the digest digestive system. So this way we can actually absorb those vitamins directly through our large intestinal wall and it bypasses the upper digestive gastric juices. So, you know, usually if you were to like that, if you notice on B12 supplements, it always says like 12,000% of the recommended daily allowance, this is why. Because in order to even get a dosage that your body can utilize, you have to take a massive quantity because the manufacturers of this vitamin know that most of it, the vast majority of that vitamin is going to be broken down before it ever gets into your body. Your liver is going to just annihilate it. It can't survive. So it's so fascinating that we've evolved with these microorganisms that are creating vitamins right for us on site so we can absorb them with ease. Now, bacteriosins, this is, a, this is not talked about very much, but I learned about this when I was studying microbiology and became utterly fascinated. So there are certain plants like the Doug fir tree, and it, it, as it sheds its needles, the needles actually have a substance, that a little toxin, that prevents any other plants from growing around it so that the Douglas fir can have that root space and that ground space and absorb all that water and absorb all the nutrients in the soil there. It's, it's like, this is mine, I'm keeping it. Well, bacteria do the same thing. They produce bacteriocins and they inhibit the growth of similar or closely related bacterial strains. So it's not like a full spectrum antibiotic. They, they call it a narrow spectrum antibiotic. Um, so I think it's fascinating the way that they work, but bacteriosins are created by these bacteria and that's, what's going to help 
support the growth of the microbiome to favor these bacteria that we're bringing into our food. Next up is prebiotics, and these are fibers that feed primarily bifidobacterium, which is a very important, it's one of the ABCs of the probiotics that you want in your digestive tract. It's the B, bifidobacterium. And these fibers are like fish food for bacteria. They're found in many kinds of fermented foods. They're also found in like onion, garlic, asparagus. People always say Jerusalem artichoke, and I had some Jerusalem artichoke last week, but that one's not as popular. Um, they're found in bananas and many other uh, vegetables and fruits as well. But prebiotics are very important. Um, I think that, well, let's talk about probiotics first and we'll mention a little bit about a little bit more about that. So probiotics, obviously, everybody should know what these are by now. They're huge. The industry is massive. It's a multi-billion dollar industry. People are buying them up all the time, taking them every day. And while there's a time and a place to take probiotic supplements, I think it's valuable to note that fermented foods contain many of these components that make them functional ferments. So probiotic supplements usually just contain raw probiotics and sometimes prebiotics. But the array of probiotics in fermented foods such as dairy kefir or sauerkraut, there's usually like between this, anywhere from like seven to 20 different probiotics in there. And it's a balanced ecosystem. They're all working together. And it also contains the organic acids, the bacteriocins. So you're getting this complete food, this like complete ecosystem that you're taking and your body can use that and like the entirety of it. And the bacteria in pro, you know, probiotics, these bacteria are super helpful. They support and modulate the immune system and they produce all the components I mentioned above, like the organic acids, the enzymes, and the bacteriocins. So arguably... All ferments really could be considered functional ferments, but I've pulled out some of the ones that have the most studies associated with them and, and show benefit with when you consume these foods. I've got, I'll just, I'm going to name off the list and there's a way for you guys to download this too. Lacto-fermented vegetables, dairy kefir, water kefir, kombucha, vinegar, dairy and non-dairy yogurt, cheese, both dairy and non-dairy, sourdough bread, injera, idlis, natto, miso, and tempeh. And it, some of you might not have heard of some of those, but that's okay. It's just giving you something to, to think about. So let's talk about, uh, well, first of all, those five qualities that I mentioned, those are the things that support the microbiome directly or indirectly. So they all together are going to help support and balance. Uh, organic acids, enzymes, bacteriocins, prebiotics, probiotics, just to make sure you guys really get that. I think this is super duper important. But let's talk about quantity. Overdoing kombucha, alcohol, even sauerkraut, which is high in histamines, isn't ideal. So when I talked about how I went extreme, like I actually did get to the point where I was eating too many fermented foods and I had histamine reactions from it. And if you look at traditional cultures, they're meant to be eaten as a complement to a meal. They're often served as condiments or little shots. Like even kombucha wasn't drank in 16 ounce bottles. People were drinking two to four ounce shots of kombucha with their meals. Um, alcohol, actually the American Gut Project has this great study that came out that talks about how do you increase the diversity of the microbiome? Because when you increase the diversity of the microbiome, you have less obesity, less type 2 diabetes, and you're even less overweight, and there's all sorts of chronic health conditions, including autoimmunity, that diminishes when you increase that diversity. So that's become an important study. Uh, alcohol, actually, alcoholic beverages, naturally fermented, they actually do help increase the biodiversity of the gut microbiome, but not in a massive quantity. There's a certain amount where it's too much, and now it stops doing that work. Um, they found somewhere between like three and seven drinks per week were helping people to have that effect, but more than that wasn't as beneficial. So I think that's really fascinating. It's this quantity matters. And you really want to pay attention to that. Resist the urge to supersize it just because it's working great for you. Just make it a consistent daily habit. So let's talk about making fermented foods versus buying, because I actually think there's something fascinating here for you to understand. This, to me, I mean, I delved into a ton of research and what I discovered as I was starting to look at this information was that people are creating fermented foods on an industrial scale and they're not getting it right. So dairy kefir, for example, dairy kefir is 
a, a really amazing food. And it's created using these little cauliflower like gelatinous um, little, you know, I'll actually just stop sharing because I think, I think I'm going to stop sharing for just a second so you can see my hands and everything. They look like little cauliflower buds and they're squishy. Um, and so these, the dairy kefir, you plop it in a, a jar of raw milk and it converts that milk into a, a very beautiful, delicious kind of runny yogurt for lack of a better term. One of the highest quality ferments out there. It has the amazing probiotic profile. There's tons of studies that have been done on it because um, it's been around for thousands of years. And some of the studies even show it's equally as effective as antibiotics in some situations and has major value even with like in Russia, it is supplemented when, when breast milk isn't available for infants, they'll water down kefir milk and feed that to the babies and they are able to sustain. So it's a really, really cool food. I'm in love with it. But the one that you buy, at least in the US, the one that you buy in the US on the shelves that says kefir on the bottle is not made with those grains. Those little grains are called scobies as well. And the, the ones at the store are actually made with powdered probiotic starter culture, usually one or maybe two different strains of bacteria. So really, it's just being made very similar to yogurt. So I hate to break it to everybody, but that's not real dairy kefir. So when you're buying it and you think you're doing all the good things for you, you're not. It, so you have to make this one at home. It's not currently legal in the U.S. to make dairy kefir and sell it with the, the SCOBYs. So you got to learn how to do this yourself. Very, very cool process. Very, very fun. And, um, you know, be happy to show you guys how someday. And easy. And super easy, right? Yeah. I, yeah. I, I have kefir that I make. I make it from powdered goat milk, actually. Nice. Yeah, it's yes. awesome. Well, and the next one is yogurt. I think that's very relevant as well because it's similar to kefir. But yogurt, you know, I find when yogurt's made at home, you can control the amount of time that it ferments. You can actually ferment all the lactose out if you do a 24-hour ferment, which is great for people who are lactose intolerant, and they can then eat that with no problem. Um, and again, the yogurt that's made in the store, it's just a very industrial process. They're adding this powdered starter culture and you know, mixing it up. And it's like, I don't know, I'd, I'd rather people do a more traditional version of yogurt. And you can do that. Um, next up is the sauerkraut. Now, sauerkraut is interesting because the stuff in the store, I used to make this. And the reason I started making this and selling it as a bigger company, because I realized there's something missing. Most of these people are not getting it right. When you actually start delving in and asking questions, there's two big things that are happening with sauerkraut. Well, I'll, I'll say three actually, three. One, they're adding vinegar. So a lot of times you're just adding vinegar industrially. It's industrial white vinegar. So it's even like a byproduct of, of a process. It's kind of gross. They add the vinegar to the cabbage and it preserves it and people eat it and they love the way it tastes because it's sour and delicious and it does those, those organic acids. That vinegar is still going to help with digestion and it has other blood sugar balancing effects as well, but you're not getting any of those live probiotics. So this is a, a big problem and you're not getting the bacteriosins. You're not getting the enzymes. You're not getting all the stuff that was created through that fermentation process. Secondly, a lot of people are fermenting in plastic like these huge companies, some of the biggest companies, I'm not going to name names here, but like some of the biggest companies on the market. And if, if, you, if you're buying it in plastic, it's probably being fermented in plastic. Um, I don't care if it says BPA free. BPA free only is one kind of chemical. BPA is just one chemical in plastic. There's all other kinds of like, I think there's BPV, BPA, there's all these other ones. I'm not, that's, that's one of my friends it studies environmental toxins. And we've had long conversations about this very, very toxic stuff. And the way that you leach these chemicals out of plastic, one of the five ways that you leach it out of plastic is you put an, ac an acid on it. These foods are acidic. They're actually very acidic. A lot of them are like pH three to four. So they're leaching these chemicals right out into it. They are endocrine disruptors. And now they're getting into your body and getting stored in your fat cells and messing with your hormones. So that's another biggie. And then the last one with sauerkraut is that um, a lot of people are flash pasteurizing it. 
And that, what that does is it calms down the bacteria. It may not kill them all off, but it calms it down so they don't have to worry about any explosions. They have a better, um, better sh it's more ease in shipping and things like that. So another industrial thing, this should be made at home. It's so easy. You could get it done anywhere from one to three weeks, but it takes about 15 minutes just to get it in a jar and be done. I call it the fastest slow food because it's a slow food, but it takes you a few minutes to make. It does its thing, and then it just takes you one second to take a bite later on. It's just sitting there ready to go. Um, the next one is water kefir, dried apricots that got you know plopped down into this beverage to give it some more flavor, and that's the the scobies, the symbiotic community of bacteria and yeast. And this water kefir is delicious. It's wonderful. Has a great probiotic profile. It's like a soda. It's a great way to get people to transition off of any kind of sugary beverages. In fact, um, the problem is that the, some of the largest manufacturers of water kefir on the market are adding patented probiotics, which are often GMO probiotics. They're owned by these massive corporations. And it's the way they're able to own a patented bacteria is that they have to genetically modify it so that it only exists when you make it their way. And then they propagate it in the lab and they study the heck out of it. And why do they study it? Because if they study it and they have all these published studies, then they can support evidence that it has health claims. And now they can sell it and sell massive quantities to companies like, um, you know, the water kefir companies and the kombucha companies as well. And so kombucha and water kefir, they both do this. Um, I have the kombucha here. It's that, it's that kind of gray, uh, brownish liquid there with the white stuff floating in the top. Um, so the, these companies are using patented GMO probiotics. And most people don't realize that. Guess what? With kombucha, only 30% of kombucha scobies at home actually contain lactobacillus. So 70% of the kombucha people are drinking doesn't even have any lactobacillus. So there's a lot of claims around is, is kombucha probiotic or not? I think there's a lot of health benefit to it. I just think that it's, it's more of a, that's why I put it under the psychoactive list is because it's just a little, I mean, there's a little bit of digestive benefit that you're getting from the organic acids and things like that, but it does have alcohol. It contains caffeine and it, it has sugar. And usually most of the sugar isn't broken down by the time you're drinking it. Because if, if it was all broken down, it would be straight vinegar. So love kombucha, small amounts for the right people. So let's talk about a little bit like how this connects to the gut. You know, I mean, the digestive system is, is amazing. Like we have the large intestine. That's where the bacteria are supposed to be living in our gut. And these fermented foods are just such a great way to support that ecosystem. It's a way that we've been evolving naturally with these bacteria for tens of thousands of years. Like, how did they ever get there in the first place? I mean, that's, that's really the curiosity that I have. Um, and microbiome imbalances actually lead to chronic health conditions because if we lower the diversity, uh, we increase inflammation, and then also if we have certain bacteria that are annihilated by antibiotics, stress, all the various things that we've been exposed to in our lives, over time, we have pathogenic bacteria that start interacting with our immune cells and they are sending chemicals and having a conversation. I say text, I, 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 I say that text messages, like the chemicals are text messages back and forth between cells. And those chemicals like hormones and neurotransmitters and some of these other chemicals, they literally are communicating back and forth between human cells, bacterial cells, and between bacterial and human cells. So this is very fascinating. And if a pathogenic bacteria is communicating back and forth between our immune cells, over time we can develop things like autoimmunity. What we, what we want is actually the probiotics to be lining the intestinal tract and communicating with our intestinal cells and saying, hey, we're the good guys. Anybody not like us, you should look out for them. But over time, if there's inflammation, this communication with pathogenic organisms, we're seeing a setup for autoimmune conditions like uh, rheumatoid arthritis, Hashimoto's, thyroid, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, um, Crohn's, colitis, all, I mean, just crazy, crazy things just from a simple imbalance of the microbiome. So uh, like, this is really cool. I made this thing called the health concerns and fermentations pairing sheet. So it has listed all the functional ferments at the top. 
And then all down the side, it has a list of our chronic health conditions of today. There's over 30 different conditions listed, things like acid reflux, acne, chronic fatigue syndrome, constipation, Crohn's, dental issues, histamine intolerance, IBS, leaky gut, obesity, um, even SIBO and ulcerative colitis, being underweight, bloating, all of these things are on here. And I have, I have it listed by like the different fermented foods across the top. And the color code has to do with which fermented foods would be a good addition, which are a case by case basis, which ferments are not recommended with this health concern. And then which kinds might be okay depending on the bacteria included, meaning you can make it with different bacteria and it might change the effect. So here's the insulin resistance sheet that I have, and we created this in our functional ferments program. Um, this is talking about which bacteria and yeast are helpful, which ones are unhelpful, and what's going on. So we list out things like Candida albicans, E. coli. All these bacteria and yeast are unhelpful in this case. And this is helpful because then you can know what to look for in your foods. And we talk, we actually list out which foods are going to be good for you and which ones aren't. We have the bacteria and yeasts that are helpful over there on the left side, Acromantia mucinophilia. That one is actually the A of the ABCs of probiotics that you want in your gut. It's a very, very helpful bacteria. It actually feeds off mucus in the lining of your intestinal tract. Um, so, you know, there's very few ways that we really know how to bring this into the body. They're working on making probiotics for it now, but in a healthy person that's producing the right amount of mucus, they're feeding it. It's there. It grows. It's very happy. A lot of the bifidobacterium are going to be really helpful. And if you look at people with insulin resistance, most of those people have extremely low numbers of bifidobacterium. Most of the bifidobacterium are coming in when you're young, but um, there's other really good sources of it as well. Lactobacillus, a major player in the fermented foods. And then, we, of course, we talk about the, the foods that are unhelpful. Some of these probably don't surprise you, <laughs> but this is how we do it. We just wanted to list off all of these different things so that you can start to go, okay, what do I need and what do I need to avoid and why? Like from a bacterial and yeast standpoint, from a microbiome standpoint, what I also think is interesting over on the left of helpful organisms, we have Rhizopus oligosporus, which is the, it's, that's the mold that makes tempeh. So tempeh, very good for this group of folks. So if you guys want to get a copy of that chart of the health conditions and fermentation pairing chart, it's at gutrebuilding.com forward slash SNT. So the Sustainability Now Telesummit. If you guys want to check that out, there it is. Actually, we're going to have a link for that right on okay. your page where people can sign up for your email and get this. Ooh, that's exciting. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, and you know, I, I don't know, what, what do you want to say? I feel like I just went on a rant for a while there. Really fun. I love, obviously you can tell I'm super passionate, but what else? What else did I, do I need to cover? What else did I miss or something? Well, I think it would be really helpful. We know that um, it's very, very easy to make sauerkraut. So maybe if we could just share how simple it is so that people can go home and make sauerkraut. Uh, Absolutely. Separate. Yeah. I mean, like just talk through the process. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's okay. So sauerkraut is absolutely my favorite ferment to recommend for people because it has the least amount of allergens in it. You know, it's, it, it, it applies to more people than any other ferment. Um, basically what you do is you take cabbage and I recommend starting, keeping it really simple. If you want to add something to help the process, you could add garlic and onion and that will ensure that this will really work because you're adding those prebiotic starches. We're going to help that fermentation process and boost it along. Plus the garlic and onion are slightly antimicrobial. So it'll help in those earlier stages to make sure nothing else grows that shouldn't be there. So first you chop everything up and then you add salt. And the easy way to do this is to just, you know, like add the salt, mix it in with the cabbage and taste it. And if it's, I know this is kind of funny because it probably, most of you probably haven't had Lay's potato chips in a while, but you know how they say like, you can't just eat one. It's because of the amount of salt on those Lay's potato chips. So similarly, you take a bite and you're like, oh, and you want to take another bite. It's, so it's a little saltier than you would expect, but it's like, oh wow, this is good. Why don't I just make cabbage salad? You're going to ask yourself that after you do it. Um, that's when it's the right saltiness. That's just a simple guideline where you don't have to measure. Um, I also have recipes where you can measure exact weights and all of that if you want to do it perfect and dial it in, but this will work. 
And then you want to get a crock or a jar that has an airlock on it. There's a company called Pickle It that has these very nice jars. They're Fido jars that have the little clasp and an airlock sitting on the top. And you just stuff it down in there and you want to leave at least probably like I'd say two inches at the top, two, two and a half inches at the top. So there's a gap of air and also there's room for it to kind of grow and expand as it starts fermenting. And it, you know, fermentation actually kind of comes from a root of a word that means to boil. Because if you watch this, if you were to take a time lapse, it would look like it's boiling because of all the carbon dioxide being released. And in the first week, it will start to like expand. And then as more of the starches get broken down and those fibers get broken down, it'll, it'll go back down. So during that first week, you may even need to go in there and push it down a little bit and get some of those air bubbles out and sh smash it down. And you let it sit out there for about seven to 21 days for a small jar, maybe a quart size jar. And then it's ready to try and it's ready to eat at that point. But you know, I recommend that people kind of dig in there maybe once every few days after the seven day mark and take a little bite and be like, do I like this? Is this the right flavor? Because some people, when they're just starting out making these ferments, they actually like a younger ferment. Their body isn't quite used to such strong acids in a more mature ferment at the three or four week mark. So just try it a little bit and see, because there's a certain moment where you're like, this is delicious. I just want to eat this whole thing. That's the moment where you put it in the fridge. And um, what about liquid? So generally, if you're using fresh cabbage, you actually don't need to add any liquid. If you are using like cabbage that's been sitting over the winter and it's dehydrated, then you might need to add a little bit of brine. And you know, most people do anywhere from like a 3.5 to 5% brine, depending on how salty they want it. Um, you can look, up, look that up online. It's really easy to find out how much salt into how much water. Because ultimately, once, once you've mixed it all up and you're like squishing it down in the jar, as you're smashing it down and getting all the air bubbles out, the brine will naturally rise. The salt is pulling all the water out of that vegetable. And it will naturally rise above the vegetable so that you have an anaerobic environment. And that's the key. I mean, it didn't go deep into that part of the science, but I have a whole video that, you know, I can share with people. Um, I, I think we're going to do that for people who actually purchase and everything. Yeah. And, so uh, let's just say that for yeah. folks that purchase the, um, the summit package, summer is generously including a uh, little, a mini course on how to make fermented vegetables. And so right. you, you have uh, the sauerkraut, tutorial in there as part of that course? I do. And I go, I have a science class there that talks about anaerobic environment and exactly what bacteria are growing and at what stage. So it's a super fun one. I do a demo. I have recipes as well. So you can try the re different recipes that I know are going to come out tasting delicious. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's a super fun process. I, I think everybody should do it. And I actually think there's one more reason to ferment Besides the fact that you can make probiotics on your counter at home, I mean, that's pretty freaking cool. It is. But there is a paradigm shift that I really believe everybody needs to experience. We live in an environment where everybody wants to sanitize everything. They're like, let's clean it up. They're like bleaching all their counters. And like, we literally live in such a sanitary environment that we are increasing food allergies and other allergies for children. Like we've got direct correlation between those two things now. Um, and what we are, what we've been trained our whole life is that if something sits on the counter for a week or three weeks, it's bad. If our refrigerator goes, like if the power goes out for two hours, I know of people who just throw everything out of their fridge away. We're terrified. And this is something that's deeply ingrained on us. And it's, it's something we've internalized and, and we've been taught this in such a young age that to, the way that I've learned to break out of this paradigm is that you make fermented foods, try it, you just go make it. You let it sit there for a couple of weeks. You watch it, you watch it bubble, you watch it do its thing. Some people might even get mold, a layer of mold on top. And traditionally that has always been a part of it. And you actually scrape that layer off, you throw it away, and you dig down underneath, and you still eat what's underneath. That's how we've been doing it for thousands of years, safely, you know? And you have to know what to smell for and what to look for, and I can teach you all of that. But what's important is that that moment that you, you put it up to your mouth, I've had this experience, and every time I've done a new ferment, I've had the same experience again. I'm like, oh my gosh, am I am I about to kill myself? Like, am I going to die? Am I going to wake up in the morning? 
And it's a genuine fear. And it comes from all the training that we have around food and germs and ah, getting sick and poisoning and dying, all this stuff, right? So I actually invite you to like learn this process, learn how to do it safely. I think that's important, you know, and go through this process and have this paradigm shift. I can tell you about it right now and you kind of think you're having the experience, but you're not. It doesn't happen until you literally have to like plow through that barrier of fear and put it in your mouth, chew it up, swallow it, and notice that you do wake up in the morning. And in fact, <laughs> over time, what I've also seen is people who ferment, they actually start to build better bonds with other people. Like they, I feel like they become more of a symbiotic human. That's an interesting observation. It's, it's been a really powerful experience. Everybody who's done my fermentationist certification program is just like, fermenting is way more than I thought it was, <laughs> you know? I think it's an amazing thing to do. I, I, I do it. Um, I have kefir. I have uh, kombucha. I have sauerkraut all the time. Love sauerkraut. I, I'm addicted to it. <laughs> you are? Yeah. It's yeah. so yummy. Yeah. So um, you mentioned water kefir and regular kefir and uh, kombucha, and all of those have SCOBY type um, requirements. People might be interested to know where they can find that. Do you have preferred suppliers for any of those things that you could recommend? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I actually try to find people who are making their own successfully and get them handed back down to them. Like traditionally, you know, we can't actually create these SCOBYs in the lab. People have tried. What's very cool is the reason that we even have any of these little gelatinous blobs that make these ferments is because for thousands of years, we've been handing them down person to person to person. That blows my mind. The fact yep. that we kept them, I mean, they're, they're so important to us that literally we've kept them alive like this for this long period of time. So you know, go to farmer's markets, ask people who are making it. There's meetup groups. You can connect with people online. You can, you can look on Etsy, Facebook, you know, check it out. I found some stuff on eBay before, but generally I try to find people in my community and so I can see what they're making and, and, you know, get a chance to meet somebody and talk to somebody who's doing it too. And then you can always call them up for tips later on, let them know how their babies are doing. Um, it's just <laughs> a fun process that connects people. So I, that's my chief recommendation. I will say that I'm, I've experimented with some of the dried SCOBYs where people dehydrate them, freeze dry them, sell them, um, and you're supposed to rehydrate them. It, it can work sometimes and there, it does work sometimes, but I've heard so many instances with my students where it wasn't working that we just we stopped recommending it. So it's yeah. just not a, it's not a natural way to do it. You want to keep these little guys alive. And, and there's even some people who have delved into the um, my microscopy of this, and they find that not all of the organisms will survive that process, and it won't necessarily come back exactly the same um, probiotic profile that it was when it was living and when it was all you know hydrated and, and alive. And they do mutate. They do change. They do change. They change depending on like with dairy kefir, for example, if you, depending on what kind of milk you're feeding it, like, you know, my preference is raw milk. And uh, because we've also found that with raw milk, the kefir grains multiply faster and it comes out better. Like I think it, that's what it was designed for. That's how they did it a long time ago. In fact, you know, the story is, is that the way that kefir grains were formed is that people were fermenting milk in like stomachs, like uh, of animals, because they needed the milk to, they needed these bags that they were using, these stomachs to like carry the milk around so they could stay alive and be, you know, do what they were doing. And um, over time, as, as they were using these, they found that like these little globules appeared. And so these little kefir, and they noticed, they were, you know, it's all an experimentation process. They probably ate some. They're like, what is this? I love chewing on this, you know? <laughs> and then they'd like plop it into the next batch and they noticed that it was more consistent. There was less spoilage. And so this just, it became this thing that just started getting, you know, passed down from, from thing to thing to thing. So depending on what you're fermenting in, like in those stomachs, I'm sure they had a little bit different probiotic profile. Um, also, you know, when you're adding raw milk, depending on what kind of animal, what the animal was being fed, you know, whatever the animal was like, any kind of medicines that maybe the animal had ingested, all of those things will influence what kinds of bacteria come out in the milk. Because as we know, milk is already probiotic. So that will help shape, you know, that community in that SCOBY as well over time. 
So yeah, healthy milk is the best option. I mean, you want the, the cleanest stuff possible. You want happy animals fed well. That's going to make all the difference. And the same with, with vegetables. I mean, you want vegetables that were grown in extremely healthy soil. This whole organic thing is great, but it's also still like an industrial mass quantity of food. I don't think that we care enough about the soil. And when you start paying attention to the gut bacteria and you start realizing where some of these bacteria come from, you know, like some of these bacteria are just coming in from our environment. They come in through the food that we eat that came on from the soil. And we're, our soil is so depleted these days that we're not getting the same array of bacteria that we used to get that, that, that can even start to populate and grow within that ferment as well. So yeah, I mean, where the source comes from makes a big difference and will influence the ferment, absolutely. Sure, the quality of the input influences the quality of the output. That's right. Uh, with kombucha and kefir, you have these grains, they're multiplying. Do you have any great things to do with the extras besides find people to give them to? You know, um, with kombucha, I've seen a lot of people experiment, experiment with jerky. Um, you can make different kinds of savory jerky. I've seen people do like grind it up with fruit and do fruit flavored jerky. Um, you know, well, there's so many little things that you can do with it, but uh, I've seen even one woman, an artist who made a jacket out of kombucha scopies, which is <laughs> gorgeous, but you sure don't want to wear that in the rain. <laughs> that would be a mess. Riot. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I mean, and some people just eat the dairy kefir grains as well from time to time. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, I haven't seen like nothing major, but you could experiment and play around. Some people have some cool ideas. Interesting. And uh, isn't water kefir made with sugar? Water kefir is made with sugar. Um, some people use straight fruit juice as well. Uh, well, not straight, they dilute it with water. Um, but yes, it is. Generally, what people do to, tr to eliminate all of the sugar is that they let it ferment all the way, and then they do a second ferment where then they add some fruit to revive the flavor and add a little bit more sweetness and then drink it at that point. Gotcha. And I, uh, with my kefir, what I've noticed is I left it longer. And the kefir grains grew faster and they grew bigger and they're more gelatinous and they're these like bubbles almost now. And um, it's, it has, it's more mucilaginous somehow too. I'm wondering, is that a good thing or not a good thing? I think it's a good thing. How long, at, at what point do you see that start to happen? How many days? Um, four days, maybe five days at yeah. the most. Yeah. I mean, you're giving it so there's various polysaccharides that are created by these organisms. There's certain organisms in there that are creating like cellulose and polysaccharides. And so, yeah, I mean, I think that that's partially what you're seeing. And I think they just need a little bit of time. I mean, 24 hours isn't a long time, but a lot of people drink their kefir at 24 hours because it's not too sour. So, you know, what I've noticed is the more experienced you are at eating fermented foods, you generally tend toward a more mature ferment that goes a little bit longer. Yeah. Um, you know, I actually have this really cool story about miso that I have to share because I think it's really fascinating because earlier I talked about acquired taste and how people's taste buds change. What I also have noticed is that depending on what your microbiome is made up of, and it's hard to know exactly. I mean, you can take tests and things like that, but everything you eat will change and affect it. And so what I've noticed is that certain people have different um, maybe ability to eat food at varying stages of rotten. So, <laughs> so like I made, I made miso one time at a fermentationist retreat. There was like 20 of us there and I made this miso and I brought it because I was like, eh, it's kind of too far gone. Like, and I wanted an example of like, here's some nasty miso, <laughs> you know, we're all experimenting, we're all trying it out. And all these things are very important to learn from. And I, I passed around the room and everybody was like, yeah. uh, -uh. And so we use the smell test. Your sense of smell is directly connected to your gut directly. And I think influenced by your microbiome. I don't have a lot of proof of this other than watching this happen over and over again. Everybody smelled it. Everybody's like, yeah, no, thanks. It gets to this one woman. Um, she's French. She's been eating fermented foods her whole life. She smells it. She goes, that smells delicious. <laughs> and I'm like, eh. she's like reaching in to try it. I was like, at your own risk. Because to me, my body was saying no. 
my yeah. body was like, no, 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 we're not putting that in there. And she was like, that smells, she tasted, she's like, this is the best miso I've ever tasted. <laughs> That's a riot. So I think there's, makes sense. you know, I mean, everybody's microbiome is like a fingerprint anyway. And so I think that depending on how robust your microbiome is, I actually, I've seen other people, same thing where they can eat more foods that I smell. And I'm like, no, but you have to listen to your body. That's like stinky cheese. Some people really love stinky cheese. Other people, not so much. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. Yeah. Very cool. So are there any other things that you would want to cover that we could add to this? Let's see. You know, I think the main thing I want to say is that I th because these foods haven't been a big part of a lot of people's lives in today's modern society. It's okay if there's some that you don't like, like the goal isn't to go around and eat every different kind of ferment every day and like go crazy. The goal is just to like be open to trying new things. And some of these ferments are really going to resonate with your body. And some of them are going to be like, yeah, this is mine. Like I like this one. Like I work with people who dairy kefir, that's their thing. So only ferment they eat. It's their favorite one. They love it. You know, and I have other people where it's kimchi. It's the only one that really works with them. That's okay. You know, you don't need to eat hundreds of different kinds of fermented foods in order to get the benefit, you know, it, and I think that's just really important to remember. Um, these fermented foods do contain histamines and, you know, histamines are the same things that our body produces as well when we're having an allergic reaction. Uh, and so a lot of times the reactions that people have if they get too many histamines is their face gets a little bit flushed or their stomach kind of hurts or they might get a headache. And so I also might just mention that for some people, if they have any kind of immune disorder or mast cell disorder or, you know, have a propensity for allergies of any kind, this could be adding more fuel to a fire. And for those folks, they I have a histamine intolerance sheet similar to the insulin resistance one. The goal isn't to just eliminate all fermented foods forever, but you might need to back off and maybe even just start really small with, I mean, literally some people, I have them doing like a fourth of a teaspoon once a week. Like just get a little bit in there to start that process, but not disrupt. We don't want to overfill the bucket of histamine. We want to just start to add to the, the, the microbiome and add a little bit of these organic acids and a little bit of these bacteriocins. It's okay to take our time here because our bodies love consistency. They don't want us trying this cleanse over here and this, this day, you know, it's like doing all these different things all the time. So that's what, that's really the, the only thing I would add to it is just, you know, be consistent, but be willing to try little bits until you really feel what resonates with your body. Cause your gut intuition is a guiding force when it comes to balancing the microbiome and being healthy. You know what would be maybe a good thing is to mention uh, some of the radical results you've seen for people. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I've worked with people who have had rosacea, um, which is a very tricky skin disorder where the face gets flushed, but, but it's usually consistently flushed all the time. And there are certain things that they'll notice they eat and it will, their face will turn redder. Um, I've had good luck helping people with that. It's a combination. I mean, fermented foods and the work that I do in my gut rebuilding program, because I think fermented foods to me is just one aspect of like eight steps of really healing the gut. Um, I've with fermented foods, I've watched people's sugar cravings disappear literally overnight. Um, I've seen people develop normal bowel movements within just a, a week of eating it, you know, being constipated their whole lives and going to the point where now they can go twice a day effortlessly. I mean, that's, anxiety you mentioned too. Anxiety is a biggie. I've seen people very much helped with anxiety. Um, they just feel calmer because if you, this is a whole other thing on gut microbiome and mood, but your gut has, I, mean, I think it's 90% of the serotonin receptors are located in your gut. And, you know, serotonin is what keeps you happy. Our gut also our gut bacteria are also helpful in producing GABA, which is another, you know, it's like an amino acid that makes us very happy and feeling good. So there's all these really cool, like components that these gut bacteria are creating that make us happy, you know? So yeah, I've seen absolute reduction in anxiety and depression and, and people also just feeling more joyful, like their moods actually just increasing, even if they weren't feeling anxious or depressed. And that's remarkable, actually, when you think about being able to eat a food other than chocolate <laughs> that, yes. that improves your mood. Uh, that's powerful. 
Yeah, absolutely. Skin clearing up, that's a very common one. You know, whether it's just blemishes um, or even like eczema, psoriasis, things like that. I've seen people's skin just even develop more of a glow. Um, and that has a lot to do with the immune system. You know, I mean, you're, the healthier you eat overall, your skin will look better because you're getting all the junk out of your blood that's like being released through your skin. But this is something that I hear time and time again after a week or two on fermented foods. People are like, my, I just look in the mirror and my skin just looks better. Yeah. You know, you know, you're processing way more of your nutrients. You're getting vitamin K. You're getting, you know, you're, you're actually like helping assist this process in a major way. So um, those are some of the biggies that I can think of off the top of my head. And we're going to get done and I'm going to think of, I'm going to be like, oh, and then there's this story and this story. There's so many things. I've been doing this for professionally for over 12 years and I've worked with thousands and thousands of people and really just continue to get blown away by what people experience. And, and with the fermented foods, honestly, how quickly, like a lot happens within the first week of eating it consistently. That's profound too. Yeah. That's a really good thing to know because everybody wants results yesterday. Yeah, that's true. That's true. So, well, in wrapping up, I just want to say that you have a huge library of courses that you offer and resources, and uh, we'll have links to all of that on this page. And I encourage people to get educated with you because uh, you're you're a treasure trove of information and transformation, really. Thank you. Yeah, I, you, this was really fun. You got me super excited talking about this topic, so thank you. Well, thank you. I, this, I think this is a great thing for people to know about, and uh, we, we're really glad to have you be part of it, so thanks. Thank you for joining us. Keep the momentum going by checking out all the other experts. Every one of them has invaluable information that you can't afford to miss. Buy the Premium Summit Package now. Join the global conversation in our Facebook group and take action in your home, community, or the world at large. Together, we will shape a world that works.